What is going on, my friends? Happy Monday to you. A happy late Valentine's Day. And I welcome in Michael Casagrande, who has the lovely balloon full floating in the background. Happy Valentine's Day. Now, did you get that for your girlfriend or was it vice versa? Oh, you know, I'm the one to do. I do all the goofy stuff. Come on. <laughs> all the goo goo stuff. Well, that's I, very I, nice. I, happy Valentine's Day, to Michael. Whoa. Good one. Whoa. Hello. Go off the books. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I propped you up before we started this thing saying you're getting so technical and getting things lined up and your lighting's good. And then you go drop the ball there. Hey, it's okay. We're talking Alabama. This is SEC Insider on this Monday, February 15th. Um, we're going to break down the Alabama football schedule that was released um, not too long ago and kind of just want to get your thoughts on that. You sort of broke things down on AL.com, sort of the highs and lows, some highlights of the schedule, some differences. And um, we'll pop that up to start things off and just kind of looking at the schedule. Obviously, they kick off against Miami, a top 25 team. And then going down the list, they come home, their first game against Mercer. And then they're at Florida this year, Southern Miss, Ole Miss, Texas A&M, Mississippi State. And as you can see down the line, they'll get the bye week there at the end of October. And then they get into LSU week there in November. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they're back in that regular slot with the Iron Bowl, which was so much different this year. So just your overall takeaways, sort of what stands out to you about this schedule when it was initially released. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of top heavy, uh, a challenging early uh, season for them, uh, especially for a season where they're going to be replacing pretty much their whole offense. All of their top skill players, obviously, quarterbacks, receivers, running backs. So it's, it's going to be a challenging run. I mean, Miami. Uh, They've been kind of up and down. They haven't been as consistent. They haven't been the Miami of the old days. But um, they return their uh, their their quarterback uh, King from last year, who was uh, you know one of the better you know prospects as a possible Heisman quarterback for for the season. He did tear his ACL in the bowl game, so that's that's a bummer for him and for Miami. Um, but I mean, two weeks later, they get Florida. Um, obviously, the team that came close to beating them this past year. Um, they lose their quarterback and some top players, but they've got some, you know, a pretty loaded uh, a roster, and that's a, that's a road game at Florida, and that's always a tough place to play. And then you have, you know, Ole Miss two weeks after that, obviously another team that gave Alabama trouble a year ago with the with that offense, and they return a, a decent chunk of that offense uh, with Lane Kiffin uh, and and A and M the week after that. So you have, you know, pretty much your your toughest games right there in that that stretch right through you know the middle early uh october so it'll be interesting um you know I, I think we noted that in that that week two that first home game is the fcs game that's normally back at the bottom um before auburn um so uh there's no no fcs tune-up for them that year this year would be arkansas instead of uh what mercer would normally be um so you know uh, it, it it's always a challenging season schedule, um, but it seems like it's going to be pretty – the most difficult part would be in the top half of it. Yeah, no doubt. And looking at that, obviously, as you said, you have Miami. And then, of course, you're on the road at Texas A&M. I was at a game there this year, and, uh, you know, it, it just – it amazes me every time going to that stadium just how crazy it is. And I think that that uh, certainly poses a challenge. And then Arkansas, I mean, that's the tune-up game – before the Iron Bowl and Arkansas has really shown some great improvement under Sam Pittman. And so I think that's a definitely notable piece of that schedule. Now, another thing worth noting that I think is interesting is so Alabama opens with Miami in Atlanta, but that's it. After this year, we're not doing that anymore. Is that correct? Uh, at least as the schedules are written at, at, at this point, yeah, that the neutral site games will be um, going the way the lawn dart. Uh, they, they've, Greg Burns kind of taking it in a different direction um, with the home and home schedules. Uh, they have Texas, Steve Sarkeesian that that next year, 2022, uh, on the road, and then uh, in Tuscaloosa in 2030. So uh, those bigger named opponents that they've been scheduling out through the middle of the 2030s already, um, those games will begin, um, you know, next fall. So uh, I don't think – I think at the time those neutral site games served a purpose and they they were they were important and they got the excitement going, but they kind of lost some of that that flavor of the the on campus feel. Um, I think you were at that uh, the Penn State game uh, mm -hmm. in State College and that was ten years ago. Now was the last yeah, time. Yeah, crazy played. to think. Yeah. 
so yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a cool setting. It was a great moment. You know, the year before that, the Penn State at Alabama. Just it was it was just fun to have like different conference teams, um, different football cultures, uh, experiencing the on campus feel. And you don't get that in Dallas or Atlanta or Orlando or wherever else they played. These games they were fine. They they served their purpose, but I I think it kind of took some of the the charm away from what makes college football college football. So I think that'll be back. Um, you know, starting next fall and um you know those schedules are still filling out but some interesting games in the future um some fun inner you know regional games yeah i think that makes uh you know you make a good point there it does kind of take the charm and the pageantry away from things and i don't know about you michael but every time i start when the announcements comes down and they're like oh in 20 you know 2030 2031 I, i literally am like oh my gosh where is life going i feel old this is crazy uh, it, it, it definitely kind of puts things in perspective for sure. But of course, football season, obviously, um, a little bit different this year, obviously this past year in 2020, because of the pandemic. And I'll get with that you in a minute on that. But when you look at, we talk about the stretch of the schedule for Alabama, but going into this year, based on what we know about all the teams, who's coming back, who's, you know, who's coming, who's going, where do you think Alabama stands the biggest threat? Who who, um, or what team do you think poses the biggest threat for this Alabama football team in 2021 as it stands now on February 15th? Yeah, I mean, between either Florida or Texas A&M, I mean, the, yeah. the early portion, playing Florida that third game of the season, you're going to have still – you're still working things out. Um, I think having the spring practice this year will be a big difference, having that ability for so many of the freshmen, the true freshmen who are coming in. I mean, Bryce Young will have his first – spring practice because they had theirs canceled last year. So uh, I think that early season game kind of on, on the road um, and, you know, it, the how much of a road factor it will be is still, I guess, to be determined for the season, how many fans will be in there. Well, you know, in, in a normal season and in, in, in the swamp, that's a, that's a loud place. It's a, it's big. It, it seats a lot of people, but it feels small and it kind of feels like a band box. So it's, I can see how that could be a, you know, an intimidating, um, Performer place to play. I mean, it would be Bryce Young's first game, presumably as a starter uh, in, in a true road experience. Uh, so, you know, there there are factors there, but the A and M seems like they would probably be the best team they'll play in that stretch, and that's on the road as well. So, either one of those two games sets up as a you know potential um, pitfall for this team, but they've you know handled those pretty well. I mean, they haven't. They lost. They beat Florida. You know, I guess that was ten years ago now too. The last time they played there, and haven't lost to A and M on the road since they joined this conference. So, you know, it's what makes it fun. You know, it's interesting you say that about the swamp, and and you look at the date being mid to late September, and it it is like truly the swamp when you go down there at that time of year. I mean, it is just literally you you walk into that stadium and it's like beads of sweat just rolling off of you. So obviously the humidity always playing a big factor down there and it, it, it definitely owns up to his name, its name. And certainly, um, you know, will be a, be a fun one. And when you talk about this sec schedule, so in 2020, because of the pandemic, we had the 10 game sec only schedule. And I kind of liked it in the article, I guess you sort of posed it, uh, you know, Nick Saban has talked time and time again about how, you know, it'd be great to, to, you know, change things up, having a, you know, an SEC only schedule would, you know, would, would be cool to see. Right. And then um, I guess you use the word to be a relic, uh, you know, for that 10 game schedule. What is it about the SEC schedule that you liked and didn't like from this last year? Um, You know, and I don't really know if you could say that it was like a, a trial era, you know, a trial point. I mean, I think everyone knows this past season was an anomaly, but with that being said, was there anything about it that you loved or didn't love that you thought was interesting or unique? Well, it was just kind of – there was never a true breather. You never – I mean, not every SEC team is is the top of the elite, but still when you're playing in that level of, of competition, guys who are recruited to the top conference in college football, it's it's, it's a more of a physical beating than when you get some of the – maybe the exhales of a, a week of a, a Mercer-type team. Um so it, it changed the dynamic. I know, I think in the past they had wanted um, nine game, uh, uh, nine game SEC schedule been a proposal at one point instead of the eight, adding one more, right. that, taking away one of the, the non-conference games. And, you know, it's kind of one of the things where you kind of have to, you know, there, there are all kinds of 
futuristic proposals that if there were to be a breakaway that only the the power five conference teams would play each other um it would take some recalibration of you know what is a good season what is you know not a, at this point that's you don't want to lose more than one game or you're pretty much out of the playoff contention so that's kind of a apprehension of teams scheduling too many of these good games and why you have you know three non-conference games against teams that are you know not going to challenge Alabama uh, in any of these games. Uh, so, yeah, and, and, the, and those games have been become kind of boring and fans, the, the tendency has really dropped in those games. And there's, you know, with the, the addition of these highly premium seating options that are charging people a whole lot more, they're not going to want to have to spend you know, <laughs> yeah. half the schedule against, you know, lower level teams that are not entertaining. Yeah, games, the press so. box hot dogs ain't that good, right? No. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's a, you know, I think you're seeing kind of a, a shift in the way that schedules are made. I mean, obviously the way Alabama has been scheduling these home and home games, it's almost an anticipation of maybe a change of way things are judged in, in the sport. And, you know, you're not necessarily need to be a 14 and 0, 15 and 0 team to win a national championship that, um, you know, NFL teams, you know, they're, they play, you know, they don't play a semi-pro team every, every mm-hmm. few weeks to, to fill in gaps. So, and teams don't go undefeated there pretty much. So, you know, it's, 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 I think we're just seeing in the beginning, the gradual shift of where things are going um, for the future of the game. All right. And as we shift our focus to spring football, it's happening in just a few weeks, which is so hard to believe Um, Alabama announced their spring game for April 17th, of course, with limited capacity, what storyline or storylines intrigue you the most heading into this season? What really just jumps off to you um, obviously, I know the quarterback situation will be the big one. Who's who's going to be the starting quarterback? But what really kind of stands out to you in this upcoming season? If you could kind of just give us a couple footnotes on that. Yeah, I mean, it's not even as I think we know who the starting quarterback could be. It's just the the, the whole offense is who's going to be who's going to be able to step into these roles that you're mm-hmm. losing. Obviously, such huge important players uh, in Devonte Smith. Um, you're losing Jalen Waddle. You're losing guys that that were kind of program changers um, and who's going to step in behind them. You have a talented group of true freshmen and and several of those freshman receivers are going to be already enrolled. They'll be in spring practice. So those will obviously be guys, John Mechie, uh, Billingsley at tight end, obviously will be, you assume will be a bigger, even bigger part of the passing game, but you know, running backs, you have established names and guys who have played, um, but who's going to step into that alpha role. Who's going to be the, you know, the Najee Harris type of this offense. So there's so many, you know, it's so many interesting players and positions that are kind of the sexy positions that people are interested in watching. You're not seeing a a competition at at defensive end or, you know, uh, maybe a a position, a a offensive guard where it's not as exciting or, you know, out there for for everyone to see. And kind of the shame of some of this is that, you know, there won't be, we won't be able to be in practice. We won't be able to see kind of the way depth charts are, are progressing throughout spring. Obviously the spring game will be on TV. Uh, it'll be presumably be on TV, but it'll be on in front of crowds. So, you know, we'll be able to see kind of how things end up. You won't see as much of the process to how they get there um, without being able to see the way practices are going. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a rebuild for an offense that was obviously a historic you know, the yardage, the points, everything they did, you know, kind of changed the way Alabama played, played offense even more so than when Tua was here. So it's, it's, there's a lot to rebuild, a lot to reload. And, you know, I think that's what we'll see in the spring, at least on the spring day and on a day game. Yeah. And of course with Bill O'Brien coming in as the new OC, I mean, would you say in, in Nick Saban's tenure, is this one of the biggest rebuilds he's had to do on offense just based on the talent hmm. that, yeah they had they lost and obviously they're having to plug back in yeah i'd have to think over some of those years but yeah i mean to lose that much of a core of your obviously your your three best players three of the five heisman top five heisman vote getters i don't you know i can say pretty easily they haven't had to do that ever so well um, and of course this being a much more explosive offense than we've even seen from some of the earlier years from um the saban era so certainly uh it will be interesting to say the least, and uh, certainly um, it'll be. It's. I mean, it's hard to believe we're just a few weeks away from uh, spring ball starting up, and 
like you said, I guess we'll we'll find out what the media access will look like. Uh, again, it'll be a little bit limited again this year, but looking forward to it most certainly. Michael Casagrande, thank you. I hope you enjoyed your Valentine's Day. I hope you got a nice meal, maybe some roses. Obviously, you get to share the balloon with the with the lady friend. So we appreciate you as always and have a wonderful day. And all of you guys out there have a wonderful and blessed